future of anything, it's always a good idea to see where they came from. So if you look at schooling, which is what I um, work on, um, uh, let's, uh, let's look at where schooling came from. Um, schooling, uh, if, you, if you trace it back, uh, and by schooling I mean schooling the way it is done uh, now, mm. the kind of schools that all of us have been to, is essentially the product of the good of this, of the last and the biggest of the empires on the planet. And it's quite an interesting history of, uh, of how that happened. Imagine that you have to run that. You have to run all those red areas, as in you have to administer, you have to do all kinds of things, provide water, provide food. And you have to do it in the 19th century without any computers, without any telephones. How on earth? would be managed. So the Victorians of that time invented a method for doing that. A method which all of us know. It's called the bureaucratic administrative machine. And it was a machine. It was a gigantic computer. Except that it was a computer made up of people. In order to make a, com a computer with people, and made a really good, fast computer with people. You need to produce those people in very large numbers. The data was on paper, and it literally traveled by ship. It would arrive from port to port, and it would get processed by these human computers. What would those human computers need as their basic abilities? That they need to know how to read. They need to know how to write clearly and legibly. And they need to know how to do arithmetic in their minds. So the Victorians made the system to produce such people. We just go forward. Um, they want you to be a model citizen, 
in addition to quarterly payments and so on. Then the employer, who uh, nobody cares for, because uh, you know he doesn't pay for his food. So he just pay one more. His requirements are really not particularly taken into account. So as a result, when uh, employers employ people, they very frequently say, "What did they teach them in school? I mean, how come we have to retrain the whole lot?" Because they're a product of the empire, that it works. And then there is one lot whom nobody takes into account. Your peers, your own friends, your own social circle. No education system on the planet is designed to cater to them. But they do want you a certain way. What do they want you to be? They want you to be cool. <laughs> the school is not cool, it's not designed. And then we have a problem, it's designed a system that is... Uh, so what's going to happen 40 years from now? Let's say take an 8 year old. By the time 40 years pass, his parents are gone with their expectations. The government has changed about 20 times. You don't know what they want to know. The employers will not even imagine what kind of employers there will be 40 years from now and what they will want. So all these customers that your system was designed for have disappeared. And you are left with the only one that the system was not designed for, your peers. Okay. So that's what's going to happen to these kids. Unless you do something about it. Okay. So schooling, as we know it now, with its military industrial background, is obsolete. It's outdated and has to be replaced by something else. But well, here is a suggestion of mine. <coughs> but you laugh, you know? <coughs> it is funny. But, uh, but, uh, but you know, I would pretend using Google to be, for example, a chartered accountant. I would get away with it, you know, quite reasonably easily. You go ahead. Okay. But this is pretense. If I use Google to pretend to be a chartered accountant for five years, Will I not become one? Or if I pretend to be anybody, if I pretend to be professor of civil engineering using Google, if I do it seriously for five years, will I not become what I pretend? So is that what learning is all about? Becoming what you pretend? Here you are, I mean, you're from various branches of engineering, which means you're all pretending to be a certain kind of engineer. I don't to, and you don't pretend for four years until you become. When I used to read about these uh, schools that don't function that you just heard about, I, I once did an experiment. It's called the hole in the wall experiment. That's what the press called it. And basically what I did was I took a computer running the English internet and stuck it into the wall of a slum just to see what would happen. And everybody said, well, you know, nothing's going to happen. Uh, what, what do you expect? Um, but I did it anyway. And uh, it just click on, uh, on that screen. Did you the cursor on the screen? No, go back. Yeah, no, wait, yeah, that's it. Yeah, uh, this is just a quick glimpse of what happened. After about eight hours, we found the children browsing and teaching each other how to browse. Which was, you know, impossible, utterly impossible. They don't know English, they don't know the school. <laughs>
Well, 14 years now, I can answer that question. There's a village, a little village called Shirgaon in Maharashtra, where one of the village uh, boys discovered, uh, as he told me, discovered a magazine called New Scientist. And he's, I said, New Scientist? And what did you do with that? He said, I read it. And I decided that I would do biology or biotechnology. And I worked very hard. And last year I met him. He's on a full scholarship in Yale in Connecticut, doing a PhD in evolutionary biology. In Hyderabad, um, in Hyderabad, uh, there is a uh, there is a, a, a child um, uh, called Afsa. Um, uh, he lives in Islam, and his father is a rickshaw driver. Uh, um, he had access to all the old computer for several years when he was a kid. Um, currently, he is uh, 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 you know, studying to be a doctor in Kuala Lumpur. Um, there are many such examples. I then started to look at what else can children teach themselves and found that there doesn't seem to be any limits to what they can. Okay. So I came to this conclusion that children can attain educational objectives on their own if they are in groups and if they have access to the internet. But how far can it go? I designed an experiment to test how far it can go and here is the research question. Can Tamil speaking children teach themselves DNA replication using a street site computer in English? About 7 or 8 or 10 years ahead of time. Um, it's all documented again. The answer is yes, they can. Incredibly. What do they need? Do they need a biotechnology teacher? No, they don't. They need a grandmother figure behind them saying, wow, you're just fantastic. So I went back to England and I looked for British grandmothers. And I know 200 of them by now. <laughs> they, they're all retired school teachers and they form a cloud whom my students call the granny cloud. The granny cloud, they beam a brand. Okay? And there she appears in the middle of nowhere with 30 years of British schooling experience. Um, so go ahead. I brought the system back into England and called it a self-organized learning environment. The BBC made a film on it, um, which will um, take me over time by only a minute, but I would like you to see that. and Debbie Mann are the vanguard of a revolutionary new approach to global education. Once a week they log onto their computers to talk to, read and play games with groups of children from remote parts of India. Uh, my name is Debbie and I live in Loughborough, which is in the middle of England. This cross-cultural education project is the brainchild of Professor Siddhartha Mitra, who, originally from India himself, took it a post at the University of Newcastle four years ago. What's the problem at the heart of what you're trying to address? You can have places where you can't feed the school. Such places exist in the world. And even more commonly, you can have places where you have schools, but good teachers don't want to or cannot go. So, what do you do about that? Because there are children in here. And that's what I'm trying to address. Let's talk about how this, this, this started. Well, that was 12 years ago. I mean, at that time, I was working in Delhi and I was training people to learn how to program computers. And only the rich children got the opportunity to, to join these expensive training programs. The poor children did not. But there was nothing to prevent the poor children from having the abilities to be excellent programmers. So I thought to myself, what would happen if I put a computer like an ATM in a wall in a slum? What Sigarsha observed was that children would flock to these hole-in-the-wall computers and without any knowledge of IT and little or no English, teach themselves how to use them. And when I asked them, they said, well, um, if you've given us a computer which works in English, then we have to teach ourselves English in order to use it. It sounds very simple, but that's what we were doing. The lesson from that first five years of experiments is that groups of children 
given access to a computer in an unsupervised environment, will be capable of self-instructing them to use it. So don't take that of these experiments a step further. Okay. So basically, that's the idea. That we make a self-organized learning environment, we figure out the children by giving them a question to which they try to find the answer of the internet. You have a granny hanging around, not physically, but over the web. All the children can ask for one and get one in whenever they want. And you put all of this together into a method by which the children guide themselves through the system. So what's the stance I'm taking now? Well, I thought somebody had to take this stance. Uh, it, I've been a teacher all my life, so it's a little hard to say. But groups of children can learn anything by themselves. Provided they can read, provided they can understand, and provided they have a system by which they can believe what they are guys. It's easier said than done because you need those first few steps, but you have to manage to do that. So I think what I can summarize my work as is to say that this is speculation. The learning is like an emergent phenomenon in a chaotic situation. You can create it that way. So if you create a chaotic learning situation, then learning or a chaotic educational system or an educational situation, then learning emerges out of it. Just like you can get, you know, a tidal wave or, a, or any self-organizing system. You can convert education into a self-organizing system. And I think that is what peer learning is all about. I get a lot of support from neuroscience, which I don't have the time to describe in detail. And if you get uh, further ahead, what's, what can be done? But I think you can build something called a school of clouds. A cloud of children, a cloud of mediators, and a place. You go ahead. It's a long sentence, but I tell you what it says. It says to create a school which doesn't have teachers, which has one manager. Everything in the school is operated over the internet by a group of mediators. The lights, the fans, the air conditioning, or what have you. Including monitoring of the children, including their evaluation, including their uh, uh, actual certification. Um, in a world where we can't provide enough schools to children, I don't see why we should try to do that. In the next two or three years, maybe we'll see a few of those come up. And uh, if you call me back in three years' time, I'm not able to tell you what the future of learning is. Thank you.